how long that's been going on. And in fact, we have colleagues who were able to put together a 17,000 year record for vegetation change in the park by taking a core from a lake within the park. Um, the person doing most of the writing analysis is Mark Bush. Barbara Hansen did the pollen ID. Don Rodbell figured out the glacial history of this park. And then Blanc and I and a host of others, you can tell, helped out with the interpretation. Uh, one of the things that's relevant to making policy suggestions, you see here, and it's not a surprise that people work with these paleo records, here's Alder acting very differently than, say, Ediosmum or the Millistomes or the bear, Bearberry or Mycenaeus. In fact, species act individualistically. And you can see that back through 17,000 years of time, and you can predict that future climate change would involve species acting independently and in changing their abundance. It was those kinds of observations that um, I contributed to an effort by the, the scopes is the scientific committee on the promotion of environmental science. Did I get it right? That, that, that's doing a volume on change in biodiversity with climate change in the Andes. Um, and we put together a chapter day full that Conservation International and myself and a host of others, recommendations for what might happen in the Andes. As a generalization, some species, those A's, will stay in place, not be affected by changes in temperature, precipitation. Some species will probably shift and shift upwards if they're controlled by temperature. Species that are more controlled by moisture might shift separately to other parts of the Andes, meaning that in terms of conservation, you're unlikely to have a stable flora, and in fact, you're likely to get new vegetation types that don't currently exist, which changes really dramatically what you might think of as your conservation goals. Saying the same thing, but looking down on it, so this would be a distribution of a species, a big block, that under climate change scenario in the Andes would be warmer and drier, would become smaller distributions, more fragmented. So if those are species of concern, you'd have to predict places that were moist, places that you could um, um, prioritize the species that are found in smaller distributions. There's going to be another set of species, though, that have larger distributions, those that are adapted to warm and or dry conditions, that would have larger ranges. If there are conservation interests, then the challenge is not to protect them, but to provide the possibility for landscape matrices that allow movement of these native species through them. A big challenge then is to how to relate that to the protected area system in Peru. Currently, 14% of the country is under some sort of national protection. They're all coated with different colors, which represent the fact that the current Peruvian protected area system is actually very diverse in terms of how much human land use is permitted inside the protected area, whether it's used for extraction, whether it's used for sustained harvesting, whether it's used for strict protection, um, and so on. However, there's a lot of things built into the system planning that don't adapt it for the future climate change. And in fact, people are very concerned about species that are well protected now in a protected area, and as their distributions change in the future, whether that park will continue to serve those protective fun functions. Another thing, though, that goes on in Peru is if you take a look at the species themselves, there's some 5,500 species of plants in Peru that are only known from Peru, that are endemic to Peru, and only about 17% or so happen to be inside these protected areas. In fact, 80 some, 85, 86% of Peruvian endemic plants are outside the protected area. So instead, we need to talk about conservation strategies in those inhabited landscapes I mentioned earlier, where you might predict the same changes, but much more challenging if they're species of interest that you're trying to follow that shift through these inhabited landscapes. This is a endemic species we've been, we spent uh, Christmas vacation trying to find, going up in valleys looking for Orthopterygium, um, documenting thoroughly in early January what valleys it did not grow in. Um, we know now some places where they grow and some places where they definitely are not found. The context then is climate change, but the, the social issues are much more diverse. So that coupled part includes things like change in agriculture, change in livestock goals, burning, deforestation, wetlands, and so on, but also connects to cities, urbanization, globalization in its broad sense, and in the case of Peru, really dramatic changes in governance that had to do with neoliberal reform. So all of a sudden asking a ecologist to get well beyond his zone of comfort and try to incorporate some of these big social changes. 
Uh, this is one example of things we've gotten into in terms of um, making policy suggestions. Uh, there is a increased interest in mineral extraction and, and petroleum extraction in the country. Uh, this is a situation where uh, there's a proposed copper mine right here located in cloud forest on the border with Ecuador. That's Ecuador over there. It's a deforested part is Peru. The proposal is to put in a copper mine that would be the fifth or sixth largest in the world. Uh, we went in and this was a situation where uh, the local people protested. There was violence, there was um, confrontation and so on. Um, and the local people organized then in response uh, to the imposition of the mining company into what they consider their lands by recruiting, in our case, scientists to go in and take a look and offer our opinion. And in fact, what we found, and what I think is going to be the case in many other areas, is that the footprint itself of the mine, probably this one right here, is actually relatively small. So from some perspectives, increasing mines in the country, it seems like a small amount of damage. However, in terms of local perceptions, it's huge. It represents really what they consider a threat, a threat to their livelihood. Um, so scales of effects and scales of perceptions of effects is really quite important. Um, I'm going to use that as a transition, say that the same thing is going on in the Amazon. In this case, this is the Amazon part of that, of northern Peru, completely um, designated now for petroleum explore, exploration and uh, extraction. Uh, but I have to comment that when I did the environmental impact assessment of this copper mine, uh, that's also 2005, I felt like I was reaching my personal limit to where I was going from being a scientist, making an evaluation that I tried to be objective about, to becoming an actor in the very process. And in fact, I did become an actor and got accused of things on the radio and stuff like that. It actually crossed my, um, my threshold for what I'm comfortable with as a scientist, but I recognize that everybody has differences in terms of how much advocacy they're able to do while still working from a scientific paradigm. And that's just to show me being uncomfortable by not fitting in. <laughs> and also my transition down to the Amazon. All right, so here we are with the oil concession down in the Pastasa River. This is the Pastasa River itself coming from Ecuador. A lot of the Pastasa is in Ecuador. Uh, I can briefly mention Ophelia's right here. So her study um, is located on the Ecuador side of the, um, of the Pastasa region. And on the Peru side is the, the work of Mariana. So she's looking at an area that's designated for petroleum extraction. The local people have blocked that, at, and the petroleum companies sort of are on standby. Um, in the meanwhile, she's looking at the ability of people to get access to natural resources they needed, both in terms of fish and in terms of uh, timber extraction. She's working with the Kandoshi people, one of the indigenous groups here. By listening to, to, by visiting several times and by listening to Mariana's evaluation, I was really struck by how you need to understand very different value systems when you're thinking about resource extraction on indigenous lands. And some really hard things to incorporate into sort of traditional biodiversity conservation planning where people's uses and goals may not be the same as what biodiversity conservationists would like to see happen. Um, another thing that's important is that the waters here are connecting to the Andes. So this is not showing up very well, but the north, central northern part of Ecuador feed the Pasasa River. So rainfall up in the Andes controls what's going on with the river. So in a lot of cases, it's what rain fell up in Ecuador that affects the dynamics of the, of the flooding regimes down below. All the other things that go on with climate change might well be happening in the Amazon. It's thought many places will be drier. Many places will have a longer dry season. Fire will become more important, um, which would presumably affect not just forests, but ecosystems that include fish and so on, the aquatic environments. Uh, we had an opportunity to look not at the indigenous people, but at the colonists who have um, um, values that have to do more with extraction and selling and so on. Uh, we, this is a project that Kelly Cruz and I put together. We were taking advantage of a especially dry year in 2005 to look at that as a way to study vulnerability of land use systems in this part of the Andes as you went through a dry period and then it got wet again into 2006 and ending up in 2007. During that time, we went to a variety of different communities. 
Did sampling have the